mystery that cannot be explained. An enigma that defies reason. A surprising and unexpected answer. To encounter such a mystery firsthand may change your life forever. Face to face with the greatest riddles of the ages, the world's most profound mysteries reach out and touch your life in ways you never imagined possible. Extreme Mysteries. Are there, as Henry Ward Beecher wrote, airy hosts, blessed spectators, sympathetic lookers-on, that see and know and appreciate our thoughts and feelings and acts. And if angels do exist, is the average person ever likely to see one, or would they recognize it if they did see one? Literally hundreds, perhaps thousands of stories have been reported in the popular media suggesting that there are real-life encounters with angels. In almost every case, an angel or angels took charge of some situation and rescued people from life-threatening circumstances. But what does anyone really know about angels? The Bible, and just about all the religious literature, is replete with stories of angels. But do they really exist? Is it possible that angels were there following the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers in New York? According to the Bible, angels visited with Abraham, Lot, Jacob, and many others. But do angels bother with ordinary people today? Angels attended the birth of Jesus and warned Joseph that there would be attempts on Jesus' life. Is there a guardian angel waiting to save you? will examine that intriguing possibility when we come back. Few things in this world have captured the imagination of so many as stories of the intervention of angels, spiritual beings that take many forms and intercede on behalf of mankind. But is there any proof these stories are not just the product of someone's fertile imagination and a certain amount of good old-fashioned luck? Can we find evidence that there are spiritual beings that come into the lives of ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances? Of the many stories of heroes and heroism coming out of the September 11th attack on America, one in particular illustrates the point. A woman, blinded by the darkness and choking dust, tells of suddenly feeling the secure hand of someone guiding her down the clogged stairwell and ultimately to safety. When she turned to thank the person who had helped her, there was no one there. Someone, it seems, had guided her to safety. But who? These kinds of stories are almost commonplace, and people are quick to attribute them to angels. But what evidence is there that these heavenly helpers actually exist? Do we know what kind of beings angels are? Have two people ever shared the same angelic experience? Basically, there are only two sources of information regarding angels, the biblical or religious literature, and the anecdotal evidence, personal stories or first-person accounts. Do either of these sources tell us what angels are really like? A biblical angel is conceptually a messenger of God, familiar with him face to face, therefore of an order of being different from that of man. In the Old Testament, the angel of God is the direct agent of his will but remains nameless and almost without revealed personality. They do, however, appear to assume many forms, in particular, the human form. The angels that dined with Abraham and met Lot at the city gate of Sodom all seem to have been in the form of men. Sending angels to help build and protect a nation or save a righteous family in Old Testament times is perhaps a matter of faith. But is there evidence that angels in earthly form might rescue someone today? Eunice Barrow claims she has felt the compelling, life-saving presence of an angel, and she's sure she saw one in a most unlikely place. I was uh, 15 or 16 years old at the time. We had just uh, moved to Compton, California, and my mother and I got on the commuter train to go to Long Beach. 
We hadn't been on the train very long when I just really uh, had an overpowering feeling. I just had the sudden feeling that I had to get off the train. What's the matter? Why are you like this? I just need to get off the train. I don't know. I know we have to get off the train. Aren't you feeling good? There seemed to be nothing Eunice's mother could say that would persuade her daughter to stay on the train, even though they were far from a scheduled stop. But oddly enough, by the time Eunice had reached the platform, the train had come to a full stop. Desperately, she looked about and finally spotted an old service station that looked like it might be open for business. Immediately, she made her way toward it. Excuse me. Well now, you'd be looking for a hospital. Keep going down this street, about two blocks. It's on the right, you can't miss it. Better hurry now. A hospital? Yes, what is it? What in the world are you doing? I don't know. This man just told me I... There wasn't time to wonder over this strange turn of events. She hurried down the street toward what she had been told was a hospital. Of course, as soon as I came in to the admittance desk, they admitted me because it was, I probably looked as sick as I felt. Doctor! Doctor! Somebody come with me! Take it to the yard! It wasn't very uh, much later that I was in surgery and had the appendix removed. My uh, doctor afterward told me that I was very fortunate that I came in when I did, that I'd gotten there just in time, that the appendix was red hot and just about to rupture. If I hadn't listened to my inner voice, I probably would have uh, had to undergo a lot of suffering and possibly death. I do feel that uh, something made me get off the train. Was it her guardian angel that convinced Eunice Barrow to get off the train? Or could it have been some unrecognized physical response sending an urgent message to the brain? But if it's the latter, where did the service station attendant come from who directed her to the hospital? More importantly, where did he go? The great difficulty, of course, in trying to investigate the nature of angels is the lack of corroboration. Does the New Testament support the Old Testament view of angels? Has there ever been an angelic event where two people who didn't know each other and never met and lived hundreds of miles apart shared the same experience? Would multiple witnesses prove that angels do indeed intervene in ordinary lives? Some truly surprising answers lie ahead. For those who have had the experience, the notion that angels are constantly among us is no longer a matter of dispute. But what does it do to the notion of angelic intervention when nothing is actually seen, but a single, life-saving event is still witnessed by an entire family? All of us, at one time or another, have experienced the intrusion of a still, small voice into our thoughts. But what if the voice was neither still nor small, and definitely not in our thoughts? Dad had a new muzzle loader. 
Jim Bilbray's father liked to collect and fire old-style muzzle loaders, and like fathers and grandfathers everywhere, he liked to share his passion with his children and his grandchildren. So he had this new one, and he, he wanted to show it to us. Well, he showed the boys how you put the gunpowder in, you measure it, stick it in, you put the patch and the ball in there, shove it on down. Then he would set this uh, primer cap uh, at the trigger mechanism where he'd drill a little hole in there or make the hole bigger and clean, and then he'd take it outside and fire it. So he had this new one, and he... he wanted to show it to us. My little daughter, Carissa, she's about five at the time. Uh, Jeremy was probably nine and Jason was 12. About 70 feet up the hill, he'd had set up a target. The target was made from an old box that had held a, a toy and he'd flattened it out and put it up there. And Dad says, I need a bullseye for the target. I said, well, I got a business card, and I fished out a business card out of my pocket. Put that on the target. That worked. Went on up the hill and stuck it on the, on the target, which was setting against a small tree stump, a rotten tree stump. This was not the first time Jim's family had seen this demonstration, but each time his dad fired his muzzleloader, Jim was impressed with his shooting skill. So he aims, and the boys just, you know, they're holding their ears. He pulls the trigger and the ball went boom. Shot through the air, hit the target, blew through it, blew apart part of the stump behind it, and ran through several saplings. It was an amazing amount of power for something so primitive, I couldn't believe it. And Dad said, well, I got one more ball to shoot. Who wants to try it now? Dad was good that way. He would let us uh, learn by doing. He showed him how to clean out the, the rifle, how to okay, uh, measure out the gunpowder so you had just the right amount, pour it in neatly, and uh, put a patch and 